And that's why we need you in 2022. Bethany needs you. You're a part of it. We need you. We've already talked about we need you to believe in the Lord. We need you to believe in His Word. We need you to believe in His church. We need you to believe in prayer. And today we want to talk about we need you to believe in life. Hey, listen, congratulations. You won. And you say, well, what did I win? You have won the greatest lottery of all time. Does that sound good? Yeah. All right. In fact, you won the gene lottery of life. That you would be you. So turn to the person next to you and say, congratulations, you are you. <laughs> you are you. Hey, listen. Listen to this. A mom has a limited supply of eggs and she delivers one every month until they run out. All right? Now, the dad has an unlimited supply of sperm and the fact is he has 300, I guess that is million, 300 million on each release. Holy smokes. Now, listen. The fertility cycle, the way it works, it lasts for about two decades, really, probably a little less, about a decade, where uh, a mom and a dad are active a few days of a month that there is a fertility spot. Listen, it gets better. The average encounter during that period, full of life and vitality, is three to five times a week. Based upon all that, here are the odds of the ratio of eggs to sperm. It's 120 to 4 quadrillion, 263 trillion that you are you. Holy smokes. You have won the lottery of life. God made you, you. And there's nobody else just like you. So that's why I said, congratulate. You are you. Isn't that amazing? And I want to talk today. All right. There, I want to talk today because the third Sunday of January is designated as the Sanctuary of Human Life Sunday. Actually, the exact day for it is this coming Saturday, so some people will be celebrating it next week, or at least observing it next week rather than today. But traditionally, the third Sunday of January is the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. And I want to address that today. Bethany needs you to care about life in 2022, to care about life. You, you see, God wants you to care about life because He cares about life. As early as Genesis chapter 1, it says, God said, let us, that is the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make man in our image, in our likeness. And it goes on and talks about being made male and female in the image of God. But it says here, so God created them in His own image, in the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. Both man and woman are made in the image of God. As God is three in one, humanity is two in one. <laughs> Male, female, but we're both human. We're both man. And so we have this likeness to God, plurality and singularity, but there's more to that. Man is made different than every other creature. We have intellect, emotion, will, self-determination, and self-awareness. We're aware of ourselves. Those are things God has. There are other things that God has that are, we, we are like Him. We know. We have knowledge. True knowledge originally. True holiness. And true righteousness originally. You see, what God did when He created man, he, he formed him out of the dust of the ground and He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul, a living being. God made us. And he made them with this potentiality to fill the earth. That's what he said. Multiply and fill the earth. God created man in his own image. Now in the third chapter of Genesis, we learn that that image was partially destroyed. But we also know that it's partially retained. It is destroyed because they sin and they lose part of that. They lose true righteousness, true holiness, and true knowledge. What we know is corrupted. We have a bent towards sin. Our, our being special now is not so special. Being holy, that is. We've lost that element of holiness. And righteousness, we don't always do things right. 
And so then in Ephesians, it says when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are restored to true holiness, righteousness, and knowledge. When I get into the Scriptures, that's why we want you to read the Bible, you, you begin to think God's thoughts after Him. When you accept Jesus Christ, you're clothed with His righteousness and His holiness, and so you are restored in the image of God, and it will be ultimately restored when we are glorified and in heaven with Jesus forever. Wow. Now, it's very interesting, in the wider sense, even though they lost it in the narrow sense, in the wider sense, they still retain this image of God. In Genesis chapter 5, it says, Now, this is the written account of Adam's line. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. And when Adam lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness. He passed on the image. Uh, his son now has intellect, emotion, and will, self-determination, self-awareness. He is made in the image of God. He's not like the animals. <laughs> Every now and then, the crane family visits the church. You know who I'm talking about? The sand cranes. And I watch them because they come up to the door of the church. I often think maybe I should just go out and welcome the family in. And, and, and then they see their reflection in the glass, and then they start pecking at themselves. They're not even aware it's them. They have no self-awareness. You have that. They have no self-determination. You determine your future. You plot it. You plan it. You plan vacations. Uh, you know that on April, 5th, uh, April 15th, tax day is coming, and you make preparations to deal with that. You have self-awareness, self-determination, intellect, emotion, and will. Animals do not have that. You are made like God, and the animals are not. You are special. You are special. So special that when the humanity corrupted themselves and God, God says, I'm going to destroy them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He walked with God. He was found to be righteous. And God says, I'm going to spare him by building an ark. And he has, has, has Noah build the ark. And he calls all the animals. And he, and he floods the whole world. And they all die. And afterward, they come out of the ark and God says he blessed them and his son saying to them, and your lifeblood I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from every man too. I will demand an accounting for the life of his fellow man. Theologians say this is the beginning of human government. Prior to this, when Cain slew Abel, God intervened. It wasn't man's responsibility. There was no, no um, government. There was no, no judges. Uh, no one to execute judgment upon Cain. So God did. But now after the flood, because wickedness was so prevalent on the earth that God had to destroy them all, He says, now I'm going to give you a special assignment. You put together a human government where you make people accountable for their actions. And so we have this time of government where there's going to be accounting. And if an animal takes a man's life, it's going to be required because that's what he says. Whoever sheds the blood of man. Now, if you read through the rest of the Old Testament, you'll find this concept of shedding blood means murder. Whoever sheds man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God, God has made man. Here's the point. The image is so special that if you take somebody else's life, it's an affront and attack on God. You have to forfeit your own life for defacing the image of God. This is the beginning of the doctrine of capital punishment to be a deterrent to crime among our people. Among our people. And as for you, he says, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth and increase. Uh, upon it. Exact same thing he said in Genesis chapter 1 when he first created Adam and Eve. said, go out and fill the earth. And that's why you are the lottery special. <laughs> You've won it. You're here. You're you. And God expects us now to protect life. That's what he's saying. It's your responsibility to protect life. To protect life. So much so that by the time we come to God giving the law to the nation Israel. He states in, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, you shall not murder. Most of us learned you shall not kill, right? 
But the word mer, kill, the word kill, katal, in the Hebrew, is in the puau. No, that, that just doesn't mean a thing to you. But what it means is it's intensive. It means not just kill, but kill with intensity. It, it means premeditated. It means murder. That's what a text says. You shall not murder, you shall not kill. You go a chapter later, and it says this. In Exodus 21, it says, If men are fighting, and they hit a pregnant woman, and she gives birth prematurely, the baby is aborted, but there is no serious injury, the baby lives. The offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the courts will allow. She, or her baby, because it survived, they can impose a fine, but the court has to agree to it. Can't be out, outrageous. But then it adds, but if there is serious injury to the baby, you are to take life for life. Wow. 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 Now, there are those who come along and they see this passage and they say, wait a minute, um, it's talking about the, the pregnant woman. And uh, it, it, it's, it's really not about the child. And I want to dis disagree with you completely. If this is just about women's rights, then why in the world did he say pregnant women? You mean you can go ahead and hit all the other women? No, you can't do that. This passage is totally about the baby. She's pregnant with a baby. There's a fight going on. There's an accidental hitting of the woman. And the woman uh, then has a, an abortion from that being hit. And, and the baby's delivered, but the baby lives. You're fine for that. But if the baby dies, it's life for life. If the baby's injured, it's eye for eye, tooth for tooth, whatever it is. Whoa. That, uh, this is to be a deterrent. Deterrent from stopping the death of the unborn, the preborn, the preborn. Now, as I said, there are those who try to make it about something other than it is. You've got to watch out for that. A lot of times in scriptures, people do that. In fact, if Peter is saying, you know, the apostle Paul writes some things that are pretty difficult. Listen to him, what he says. In his letters containing some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant, unstable people distort, as they do other scriptures to their own destruction. There are those who try to twist the Scriptures. That's what the Net Bible says. Some things in these letters are hard to understand, things that the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they also do to the rest of the Scriptures. We see it constantly going on today. You get to choose your gender today. Oh, no, you don't. You won the lottery God picked the number for you. You are either male or female. He makes no mistakes assigning the body to the gender. Listen, if you have a body that is biologically male, you're a man. If you have a body that's biologically female, you're a woman. That's it. It's settled. Whether those come along and try to twist that, God might have made a mistake and put you in the wrong body. No, God doesn't make any mistakes. On a passage like this where we're just talking, it's about the baby. It's about the baby. It's all about the baby. In the, in the book of Psalms, the psalmist says this, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth. I kind of, I, I was watching the show this last week on the DNA and how it's just woven together and then it's spun so neatly. I don't even think the psalmist knew it, but he was almost depicting the DNA molecule that renders you to be you. Wow. He goes on in the very next verse, says, Your eyes saw my unformed body. Thank God. Thank God for ultrasound. And every year they get better and clearer. It's almost like now we can see what God sees, the unformed body. He says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Songless, you know my name. 
He knows my name. He does. He knows me. He knows me inside and out. Before I ever was, what I will be, how long I will be, He knows me. Jeremiah the prophet says this, The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. He's talking about a person. This is a person in the womb. Before you were born, I set you apart. I set you apart and I appointed you as the prophet to the nations. God had already known who he was, gave him an assignment and a task, and God is the one who knows him. We move to the New Testament. And you know the, the, the Christmas story. We tell it every year here. And uh, Mary gets news that uh, she's going to have a baby. And, and the angel tells her that she's going to have a baby, overpowered by the Holy Spirit. And, and in that message is, and your cousin Elizabeth is already pregnant in her old age, which is miraculous in itself. And as soon as uh, she heard that, Mary packs up and she heads off to, to visit her cousin who's six months pregnant, and as soon as the sound of Mary's greeting reached Elizabeth's ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. This is just loaded. The word baby, brephos, is used after you're born, it's used too. Before you're born, it's used too, because it's already a baby. In fact, when a person is expecting, you say, oh, what is the baby? Is it going to be a boy or a girl? I've never heard anybody say, what is the blob? What is the mass? What is the fetus? It's the baby. It's the baby. The baby is in my womb. That's, that's what we call that preborn today. The baby is preborn. Watch, the baby has his own actions. He leaped. And then notice the baby has emotions for joy because of something the mother heard. Of course, God is at work in all of this because this is John the Baptist and he's already leaping for joy that Mary is going to be the mother of the Savior of the world. Isn't this amazing? This is amazing. Wow. I'm saying all this because preborn children must be protected. They must be protected. Now, there's objections to the fact that a preborn is actually a baby. There's objections. First objection is, <clears throat> it's her body, my body, my choice. Well, it, actually, it is not her body. It, it, technically, it is not her body. Scientifically, it is not her body. If you were to extract the DNA from that little tiny body within the womb, you would find that that DNA is totally different from the mom's. It is connected so that you can connect it and actually identify who the mother is. But that baby's DNA at the moment of conception is different from the mother. That baby is not the mom's body. That baby is its own body. Its own body with its own person, like Jeremiah and John the Baptist, in the womb, their own person. The baby is in her body, but the baby is not her body. Not her body. It's like if I invited you to come to my house. You would be in my house. If I got tired of your presence, I'd kick you out. Right? I don't want you there anymore. I'd kick you out. And you say, wait a minute, well, my body, my, my house, my rules, but I could never kill you and then drag you out. Hey, my house, my rules, I can do whatever I want. No, you can't. No, you can't. First objection is my body. No, it's not. It's its own body. Second objection that I hear is this. It's not viable. That baby couldn't live on its own. The preborn baby is unable to interact and survive on his or her own. And the truth is, neither can the newborn baby. Once the baby's delivered, it can't, it's not viable on its own. That doesn't give you the right to kill the newborn just because it's not viable. Why does it give you the right to take a, a preborn life? It, it doesn't. A person who's in a coma can't take care of themselves. Isn't that right? That doesn't give anyone the right 
to extinguish their life. It doesn't. Nor is a mentally impaired person capable of taking care of themselves. You get the point? This is not an objection. The third objection is birth defects. We can test now and know if the baby is going to have Down syndrome. We can test and know now if the baby's going to be blind. We can test and know. And, and you know what? Moses was objecting to God that he shouldn't go and lead the people of Israel out, out from the bondage in Egypt. And Moses said to the Lord, I am slow of speech and tongue. Some think that he had a speech impediment, uh, that maybe he stuttered. Or maybe he slurred, or, or, and that he would be mocked. Something, it just means he was not a good communicator. That's all, it just meant. But to that objection, Lord, send somebody else, because I'm not a good speaker. The Lord said to him, who gave man his mouth? Who makes the deaf or the mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Whoa! You see, we consider these defects, but God says, no, 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 no. I made this person this way. I pulled the lottery number for that person to be just like that. Why? Why? Disciples wanted to know that. A man was born blind. They come across him and they say to Jesus, hey, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his parents or because of him? The third verse there, it says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Whoa, do you get that? Even in his blindness, he was displaying the work of God. Wow. And then he goes on and does more than just display the work of God. Displays the miracle of God because Jesus anoints his eyes with spit and, and dirt and mud and he puts it in his eyes and he heals the man and it displays the glorious, miraculous work of God. Holy smokes. The medical professor teaching medical ethics at the university asked his class, I got a scenario for you. Tell me what you would do ethically. The father had syphilis and the mother <clears throat> had tuberculosis. They had four children. The first child was born blind. The second child died in, in birth. The third child was both deaf and dumb. And the fourth child was born with tuberculosis. What would you do? What would you tell the parents? The class unanimously said, you need to abort the child. And he then said, congratulations, you just murdered Beethoven. We never, ever know what God is doing in anyone's life. But it's all for the glory of God. All for the glory of God. Next objection. Well, what about rape or incest? The real question here is, would it be right to kill the baby of a rape after he or she is born as well as before he or she is born? If it's all right to abort a baby because there was incest and rape, well, what if you uh, were to discover one day, taking your DNA test, uh, either me, me 23 or, or uh, one of the other ones, you, you were to discover... Uh, my dad is not my dad. My uncle is my dad. My sister's brother is my dad. Oh my, I'm a product of rape. I should be killed. Is that what you think? No way. No way. In fact, the Bible says something quite different. The rape was not the baby's fault. The rape was not the baby's fault. In fact, in Deuteronomy 24, 16, it says this, Fathers shall not put to death for their children, nor children be put to death for their fathers. Each is to die for his own sins. Listen, just because someone committed a horrendous act doesn't mean you kill somebody else for it. Nah, nah, nah. 
Another objection that I hear is, well, what if it's an unwanted pregnancy? I mean, what if they don't want the baby? Should everybody be wanted? This is just another way of saying, listen, think about it. This is just another way of saying people should have the right to kill other people that they do not want to care for. And if it's true of the young, it can be true of the old as well. They're too much of a bother. Let's just take their life. Take their life. Besides, there are adoptive parents who want babies. How do you know? How do I know? I was one of them. I was one of them. We had had two boys. We lost our son, Mark. He died after maybe about 30 minutes of life. He wasn't any longer than the length of my hand. He was a second trimester baby, which meant his lungs were not yet developed. Pretty near everything else was, though. I saw him struggling and gasping for every breath of life. I mean, he was. He was just struggling. I went out because I was in there for the delivery, and I slipped out because he asked me to slip out for a moment. I went to the doctor's changing quarters, and there was a bench there, lockers, and I got on my knees, and I prayed, and I said, God. The doctor just said there's like one in a million chance he'll survive, and make him be the one in a million, please, Lord. But I went out, and a little later, he stopped crying. He lived about 20, 30 minutes, struggling for every breath. You know, if he, if he would have been born in that same condition today, he would live. Modern technology would make him survive. The doctor was a friend of mine. Um, I don't know why. I would visit the doctor's office with my, my wife and the obstetrician, and, and uh, he would notice me in the office. He'd call me back, and, and we'd sit and chat. Now, there's all these pregnant women sitting out in the lobby, you know, <laughs> waiting. Why is the doctor, why is my appointment so late? That's because I was back there talking with the doc, and we're talking back and forth. And, and we, we developed this friendship. When I visit in the hospital, sometimes I'd meet him in the halls and he'd say, you want to get a coffee? Well, I don't drink coffee, so you know, that didn't happen. And so, uh, but we had this friendship and, and uh, after we lost another child, uh, uh, that child died in the womb. And so uh, we were posed with the, the issue of actually, um, do we perform an abortion to take the dead baby out? or you want to go full term with the dead baby to deliver a dead baby. Well, we made the decision to go ahead and have the abortion of the dead baby. And of course, I was there again too because the doc's my friend. You know, he went, come on in, you want, <laughs> like I wanted to see this. But when he pulled the baby out, the umbilical cord was like, do you remember the model airplanes that had the rubber band on them and you spin the prop? and it would be all bunched up, and you get it almost to a point where it would snap, and then you release it and the plane would fly. Well, the umbilical cord, because our baby was spinning around constantly in the same direction, spun so many times, it pinched off the umbilical cord and strangled himself, the supply of oxygen and nutrients from the placenta. So this doc um, calls me one day, I'm actually in a deacon's meeting at the church. And I take the phone, yeah, Dr. Kennedy, he says, uh, hey, listen, uh, are you busy? I said, well, I kind of am. He says, okay, I'll be brief then. He said, you filled out papers to uh, be foster parents. We had with the city of Philadelphia. And, and he said, but I got something better. How would you like to adopt? And here I am in this meeting, adopt. Whoa, this, this is like great. And, 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 and he says, hey, listen, you got plenty of time. I says, you can call me back later. You got plenty of time to decide on this. Three weeks later, we had a baby boy. <laughs> yeah, we adopted. Listen, we wanted that baby. If I were to tell you what I had to do in order to get that baby, because financially I was strapped. I, I had to literally give up my future to financially have that baby. It was the best decision I ever made. Listen, unwant, somebody out there wants babies. Somebody. It's the adoption option. Listen, 
There's another objection. It restricts the freedom of the woman. Shouldn't the woman have the right to decide what both... I mean, doesn't the decision belong with the mother? Don't pro-life laws restrict mothers' freedoms of choice? And the answer is, yeah, sure. And so do a lot of other laws. You can't drive intoxicated without penalty, right? Come on now. Listen, you can't steal. Hey, there's a house down the street from mine that's probably over a million dollars. What if I just say, hey, I'm going to go in and take over that house. I want that house. I'm going to steal. I'm going to kick you out. I'm going to take your house. Can I do that? No, I can't do that. But I want to. It's my freedom. I don't have the freedom to beat anybody up. I don't. I don't have that freedom. Listen. Yes, it should restrict the choice. Now, people say, well, then what's, what you're doing is you're forcing your morality on someone else. Christians should not to try to impose their moral values on other people. And the answer to that is, oh, yes, we should. Yes, we should. Yes, we should. Most of our laws are based on moral values. Think about it. The law against theft, based upon thou shalt not steal. Hey, the, the law against polygamy and incest, no adultery and none of that nonsense. Listen, the law against sexual harassment, why? Those are all based on moral laws. The law against murder is a, a moral obligation. So why would we not impose our moral values on our land? We should, we should, we should. The last of the objections I want to deal with is save the mother's life. I'm extremely rare. It takes place in less than 0.118% of all abortions. And the, but the b- bottom line here is if you can make an exception for one, then we've got to make exceptions for everything. And that's why they want to argue this argu- argument. With today's technology, I would recommend that you try to save both. I'm not planning to preach till midnight here, but I got the greatest illustration in the whole world about this, but I'm not using it because it's a long one. But what? What if I had or encouraged someone to have an abortion? I feel guilty. Pastor, you're making me feel miserable. I, I feel horrible. What do I do? You thank God that he is a forgiving God. Micah put it this way. Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the the transgressor of the remnant of his inheritance. You do not stay angry forever, but you delight to show mercy. Mercy is to withhold from you what you deserve. Grace is to give you the good things you don't deserve. And pardon is part of all of that grace. God is a pardoning God. If you will just confess your sin... He is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I know someone watching or maybe today, next week, somebody here is thinking, I am such a wretched person. You are no more wretched than Moses. You are no more wretched than the Apostle Paul for they too were murderers. And the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ pardoned them and that will pardon you. But if you don't accept the pardoning from our God, you will bear a guilty conscience every day of your life. But if you will just say, Lord Jesus, forgive me for my sins, he will forgive you. So how can I care about this whole thing? I understand the theology behind it. How can I care? I just got a short video. Oh, you stopped my video clip. Is there any doubt we are in a war? The battle is raging every minute of every day, and each day we are given a choice to engage the enemy or stand by and watch as over 2,300 innocent lives are extinguished every single day in the United States. When a young woman finds herself in an unplanned pregnancy, she may feel that there are no options, that there is nowhere to turn and no one to talk to. Abortion may be the only solution that seems right to her at the time, but there are options. Saving babies and souls is our mission. This mission starts with the clinic staff and their desire to witness to each and every girl that comes into their clinic. 
Our evangelism tool, The Invitation, encourages and educates the clinic staff and volunteers to openly share the gospel with clients on a daily basis. After being sent to over 500 clinics in 2020, over 2,100 pregnancy clinic directors, staff, and volunteers have now been trained to share the gospel. Fearlessly sharing the gospel to a young girl in an unplanned pregnancy is not an easy task. But consider the stakes. We know it is worth the fight. And we are seeing the fruits of those efforts as 370% more salvations are occurring in those clinics who have used the invitation. A picture is worth a thousand words. And when a client can see her baby thriving and growing inside of her, it changes everything. An ultrasound session allows the client to see her baby and realize that it is a child who deserves life. That is why in 2020, Preborn stationed 44 ultrasound machines and provided over 41,000 ultrasound sessions across the nation. Witnessing a changed life, a redeemed soul, and a saved baby are encouragement to keep going, to do more, and to continue the fight. Because of your partnership with Preborn, we are celebrating 31,407 babies saved in 2020, with 6,500 commitments to Christ, and over 60,000 pregnancy tests. We thank you for the ever-growing impact you are making for God's kingdom. Preborn, glorifying Jesus Christ by operating, equipping, and leading pregnancy clinics to save more babies and souls. Wow, is that powerful? Could you advance it to the next slide? Thanks. You can support a pro-life outreach like Preborn. It's very simple. You won't forget this. It's preborn.org. Preborn.org. A gift of $140 provides free ultrasound sessions for five young women. Women in unplanned pregnancies so that they can see their baby and 80% of that, four out of five, will actually not abort their baby. Isn't that amazing? We can do something. You can go there and you can donate. You can volunteer for a pro-life organization. You can write our government officials about pro-life legislation. You can speak up for pro-life daily in conversations when it arises. You can speak up for the unborn. Listen, and you can vote pro-life. You can choose the candidates who are going to make the decisions on whether life will be sustained or taken away. If nothing else, you can pray. You can pray. You can pray. Think about this. I came across this when I was preparing. The spread of Christianity and Christian influence on government was primarily responsible for the outlawing of infanticide, child abandonment, and abortion in the Roman Empire. Wow. The church made an impact on a pagan culture. From the time of Christ to the time that this took place was 341 years. But Constantine declared Christianity the religion of Rome in 313, which would have been just about 30 years it took to have such an influence upon an empire. Surely if all the Christians in America voted pro-life, we would change the course of America's history. It's true. It's true. I want to turn from Bethany needs you to care for the pre-born life. Bethany needs you to care for the family, for family. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, it says, give the people of these instructions too, so that no one may be open to blame. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he is worse than an unbeliever. Why? Because even unbelievers take care of their family. Take care of their family. We as Christians should even be a better model of taking care of our families from pre-born all the way to the grave that we take care of 
of family. We take care of family. One final one that I want to leave with you today. Bethany needs you in 2022 to take care of the needy. We are an exemplary church at this. I love Bethany because Bethany is always looking for an outreach to help somebody somewhere in some way. <laughs> We're kind of like, you know, the man asked uh, uh, Jesus when he said that, that the greatest of all the commandments is to love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said, who is my neighbor? And you know the story. It's the Good Samaritan. He tells the Good Samaritan story. Who is my neighbor? It's whoever has a need. Whoever has a need, that's my neighbor. If God brings the need across my path, I am the one that he wants to address it. Listen, when it comes to the time of the judgment of the nations in Matthew 25, the goats, goat nations are set apart and the sheep nations are set apart and the goat nations, they're accused of not helping anyone, but the sheep nations, he says, the king will say to those on his right, the sheep, come you who are blessed of my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Why does he say that? Here's why. He says, for... I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was strange, and you gave me an invitation. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came and visited me. Do you see the categories there? Hungry, thirsty. A stranger needing shelter. Clothing. Also sick and incarcerated. <laughs> I mean, he's covered a lot of categories. And then the righteous will say, answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry? They're thinking of the king. Uh, when did we feed you or see you thirsty or give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or, or needy and clothes and clothe you? Uh, when did we see you sick or in prison or even go visit you? And then he said, the king, this is what the king says, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Whenever you did it, for one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it for me. You did it for me. Wow. Wow. Here's what I'm trying to say. I want this to take this with you today. God cares about people. Just say that under your breath. God cares about people. He cares about the preborn. He cares about families. He cares about the needy. Therefore, we should care too. Amen? Amen. We should care too. We should care too. Let's pray. Father in heaven, put that same care in our hearts for the fellow image bearers around us for the pregnant girl who's undecided. Help us, Lord. Help us. Appoint her to life. Lord, for those in our families that uh, it's difficult sometimes to care for our families when they are so difficult. But help, help us, O oh Lord, to be like Jesus who loved the unlovely and sacrificed himself for them. And Lord, then there's the stranger in all these categories. Open our eyes, oh Lord, they're about us every day. This is our mission, this is our assignment. The second of the greatest of commandments, to love them, Lord, and to take care of them. Lord, may we today have our eyes opened all about us to see the people you want us to care for. This I pray in Jesus' name, amen.